Before the last presidential election in 2020, a reporter wrote a story that predicted the future. I remember reading it. It was one of those pieces of journalism I'll never forget. Though it's hard to put myself back into that moment in time, into that headspace, when the frightening things the reporter was saying were about to happen hadn't happened yet. And I still had to wonder, is this guy right? Will the things his story is predicting become true? But he was. And they did. The reporter's name was Barton Gelman. In his story for The Atlantic, he laid out ahead of time the specific tactics then-President Donald Trump and his allies would use to attempt to stay in power, regardless of the outcome of the election. The story was called The Election That Could Break America. Barton Gelman predicted that Trump would never concede defeat. He identified January 6, 2021 specifically, as a date that could see chaos. He reported ahead of time that there would likely be immense pressure on Vice President Mike Pence to not certify the electoral vote. Barton wrote all this in September 2020, a full month and a half before Election Day, before Trump stepped out on that election night at the White House and delivered a speech insisting the election had been stolen from him. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen. We will stop the steal. Before the insurrection on January 6th. Before Trump supporters gathered around a noose on the Capitol lawn that day and shouted, hang Mike Pence. I didn't know Barton Gelman's name when I read this piece, but I realized when I looked him up that I definitely knew his work. He was the reporter who brought us the huge Edward Snowden leak via the Washington Post, which revealed for the first time the National Security Agency's vast surveillance of American citizens, for sure one of the biggest stories of the last few decades. Barton's won three Pulitzer Prizes. Over 30 years of reporting, he's covered the Pentagon and 9-11 and the War on Terror. He traveled with weapon hunters in Iraq and documented, at a time when many others were not, that they weren't finding weapons of mass destruction. He's the kind of journalist who moderates panels with former secretaries of Homeland Security. On his website, he lists five different methods for sending him confidential material securely. When his Atlantic story came out, the chatter among journalism types online was all, Bart Gelman wrote a piece. Ooh, Bart Gelman wrote a piece. Like he was a high priest of journalism, sending down a proclamation about the state of our country. So I was startled and intrigued. When I read something new Barton Gelman wrote at the beginning of this year, it was a tweet in which he announced that after more than three decades, he was quitting journalism. It was time, Barton wrote, to get off the sidelines and join the fight for democracy. Apparently, Barton Gelman felt he couldn't do enough as a journalist to help our country, to make enough of a difference. This feeling that journalism is too passive, that it's failing to meet the moment. I've been wrestling with that myself, but I don't want to quit the profession that I love. Instead, this grappling became a big part of the impetus for this show, where I'm questioning the ways we do journalism and trying to figure out how can it change, if it can change, to be more impactful. Some of this came out a few mint juleps deep in our last episode, Drinks for Five, as Ted Herndon at the New York Times and my mentor from This American Life, Ira Glass, We're talking about their feeling that the job of a journalist should be to document the world, not necessarily to try to influence it. And I said, you talking about like journalism's role being to reflect reality or just kind of document that's the best we can do. I believe that for a long time and I've been in this zone of just feeling like it doesn't feel like enough. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah. that's kind of the spirit of this. It's just like, I don't know. there's the something, like, that felt like enough for so long. And, like, yeah. that that was our role and our purpose. And and there's something about it just, that I just hit a point where, like, it, it feels insufficient. Even though this sentiment has been growing in me for years now, I still feel stuck, or at least much more comfortable, in the observe and document approach I'm used to. It's a conflict for me. When I read Barton Gelman's tweet... I imagined that he felt similar to me, but from afar at least, it appeared that he'd chosen a different route to deal with his frustrations. Apparently, he decided that continuing to do journalism wasn't the way, that in order to have the impact he wanted, he was better off freeing himself from the field entirely rather than trying to change it. I look up to Barton, aspire to do work like him. So I needed to know, what led Barton Gelman to quit journalism? What's he doing now? And what does that say about the limits of the work we do? He told me something that I did not expect. 
from KCRW and Placement Theory. I'm Brian Reed. This is Question Everything. Stick around. When Barton Gelman quit journalism in January, he went to work in an organization whose research he'd cited in his articles over the years, the Brennan Center for Justice. It's a nonpartisan nonprofit whose mission is, quote, to reform, revitalize, and when necessary, defend our country's systems of democracy and justice. They filed briefs in support of the Voting Rights Act when it's been challenged. They advocate for reforms on the Supreme Court, like term limits for justices. They've represented Guantanamo detainees. That's where I went to meet Barton, to find out how he came to make this remarkable career move at the Brennan Center offices in New York. It's a think tank. It's a kind of a policy advocacy shop. They do litigation, and they uh, they do very they, good. You. good sort of, uh, <laughs> right? It's a we now, right? You work here now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm still getting used to that. Uh, yeah. To so, the we, to the saying, like, we do litigation and we advocate yeah. for policy. That still yeah. feels a little um, unnatural for you to say. You know, I've always been trained to kind of keep myself out of the story uh, as a journalist, to be standing back and reporting on what other people do. So I'm still not as used to the first person. Well, thank you for doing this. I know you're very busy. You know, just seeing your tweet, just being an admirer of your work, I have kind of watched what you've done in the last year. And it, and it strikes me as extraordinary, someone with your track record and just your experience as a journalist – to feel that you had to leave the field to really have the impact that you want to have right now. Can you point to when this feeling that you wanted to leave or that you had to leave in order to take the action that you wanted to take started to bubble up for you? Well, I mean, I have written about a lot of bad and scary things uh, over my career and every now and then I felt like I shouldn't just be a spectator. Uh, maybe I should try to get involved and try to help. I was and I'm, I'm still convinced that doing the right kind of journalism is constructive and valuable. Mm -hmm. But this time just felt a little bit different for me as a citizen. There's a threat that we'll no longer have the power to decide who governs us or to ensure that the rule of law is upheld, to ensure that constitutional rights are upheld. There is way too much support for sort of dictatorial powers in the hands of one candidate or one president. And I felt like at this time, mm -hmm. The most important thing I could be doing was to deliberately try to influence events. And that is not quite kosher for a journalist. And when did you start getting that inkling that you wanted to do that? Like more recently, like, you know, in the last four years, do you remember when it started to occur to you that maybe this is where I'm going to head? So I did a, a cover story for The Atlantic a few months before the election in 2020, and it was called The Election That Could Break America. A very memorable story. <laughs> well, it got attention. Uh, I felt like I'd had some impact. I felt like I'd issued a warning, and it did motivate people and institutions. I felt like I did my job. But then a year later, I wrote another cover story. It was called January 6th Was Just Practice. In this story... Barton investigated Republican efforts to seize power, regardless of the vote, in the 2024 presidential election, the election we're in the middle of right now. He looked at how Republicans have been preparing legal theories to swap in Trump-friendly electors, replacing officials on election boards state by state, pushing bills that would give them more control over vote tallying. While he was reporting on this, Barton went to a protest in D.C. in support of people being held on criminal charges after invading the Capitol on January 6th. It was here that he met the person who had set him on a new life path, a New Yorker who Barton ended up profiling in the cover story. I picked a guy out of the crowd. He was a tall man uh, wearing a New York firefighter's uniform. And other people sort of seemed to be deferring to him and listening to him. So I struck up a conversation, and it was a very pleasant 
guy and open to conversation, you know, which is always true if you go to one of those mega events. And I ended up talking to him for probably 12 hours over a period of days. Um, Richard Patterson. I just tried to probe him in ways that were consistent with my journalistic methods over the years. Like if I could just actually examine a belief and produce evidence, maybe I could change minds. Maybe we could come to a common understanding of the truth. You know, he would give me some election statistics and say, I don't know, there were more votes for Biden in Pennsylvania than there were registered voters. So obviously there was fraud. And so I went out and did a little research on that and figured out what the origin of that claim was. You know, I said that originated in this tweet by a person who conflated two different categories of numbers. So this number came from this source and that number came from that source and it's apples and oranges. So it's actually not true. And you sent them the sources, the underlying yeah. sources. And I said, uh, I sent them to him and I also talked to him about it on the phone. This was after the demonstration. And that was like a complete fa- failure. Uh, <laughs> it just, you know, it, uh, it just glanced off him. He didn't engage with it because, uh, I don't know, cognitive dissonance. You know, he was convinced of something. And so if that evidence was no good, he just, he just switched immediately to another one. And was that surprising to you? I mean, I kind of – I was generically aware that people did this, but I I guess I imagined that the cure had not been administered properly <laughs> and that if I only just kind of persuaded someone to kind of engage with facts, that they might go, oh, that's not what I thought. Uh, that's different. Maybe I was mistaken. I, I mean, so it really did – God, I undermine my faith in what I do for a living as a journalist. That experience with, yeah. with Richard Patterson, the firefighter? Yeah. Barton didn't give up. Richard Patterson kept presenting him with more stories and theories, and Barton kept running them to the ground. Like, there was a man who broke into Nancy Pelosi's office at the Capitol on January 6th and stole a computer. Patterson told Barton that he believed that man was actually a member of Antifa, the left-wing group, masquerading as a Trump supporter. And I said, how do you know that? Why do you think that? And this one, uh, he was able to pinpoint. He named a retired general who had explained that this was the truth uh, on, on in a Rumble video that he had seen. Rumble's like an online platform, basically. Like Rumble, a video yeah. It's the kind of uh, yeah. right-wing YouTube and so I went and found the video, and then I interviewed the general. I tracked him down and asked him how he knew. How he knew that it was Antifa masquerading that, as – Right. Actually, his view was it was Antifa working alongside U.S. special forces uh, from the deep state who had actually on January 6th broken into Nancy Pelosi's office and stolen her computer. Okay. And he said – that he had a source who he wouldn't name to me, who had been a witness on the ground, who had said those guys looked like special forces. And as they were leaving the Capitol, they had bulges under their coats that were sort of rectangular, and they looked like they could be laptops. That was the evidence, uh, Okay, which is... So it's like, I hope your listeners will agree comically inadequate for claiming that it's Antifa backed by special forces and rectangular bulge and that he knew that they were the ones who had gone into Nancy Pelosi's office and stolen her. And he had nothing more than that, obviously. That's all he had. Yeah. OK. And then I got a call back from this general's son who said, I heard you talk to my father. And I said, yeah. He said, I really wish you wouldn't use that interview. My father has dementia. And we're trying to get him to stop talking about this stuff in public. So, I mean, that was that was the evidence. The evidence was, you know, a, a preposterous story by a guy with dementia. But he had convinced 
probably a lot of people, including my firefighter, Richard Patterson. And then did you go talk story. to Richard Patterson about it? And I told I told him the whole conversation. I didn't write all of it because it was very personal and, you know, guy talking about his father's mm -hmm. decline. Uh, but I told it all to the firefighter and he said, you know, this general's a patriot. I believe him more than I believe the FBI. It just, I mean, it, no impact. There's a little bit of a crisis of confidence. I'm not saying I've lost all belief in the importance of journalism. I haven't. But it started to feel like that was not the most powerful tool available to try to protect democracy at a time when it's under threat. It's interesting. It's like you got a firsthand experience of what it means to put reporting out into the world. Like normally you're reporting something and you're publishing it and there's a bit of a distance between you as the journalist and the readers. Exactly. You don't totally know how the findings or the facts are resonating in people's minds, what they're making of them. And here you had a very kind of acute experience face to face with someone where you did reporting, showed it to them, and it was completely useless. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> just that I was putting it – Yeah, well, first of all, you're right. You tend to get feedback from strong partisans. So you get you know angry, trollish kinds of emails and phone calls from one group and you get, thank God for you, uh, that great story, what can I do kind of emails from someone else. Uh, but you don't get reactions from very many, I don't know, average readers. Here, I was not only putting it out in the world, but I was interactively explaining it to someone and iteratively going through, you know, so why do you think this? And now here's the documentation and what's your next point? And we went back and forth and back and forth. And at the end of it, he was just absolutely unchanged. And it, yeah, it just made me wonder what's the value of doing what I'm doing. Documenting reality no longer felt like enough. Part of the problem is that even in the best of circumstances, it is so much work to document reality truthfully. An aging general can casually spit out something untrue. They took Pelosi's laptop. People post it with almost no effort or thought. There were some people in there that were special forces mixed with Antifa, and they took her laptop. And now, if Barton wants to say something true about this as a journalist, he has to dig up this video, track down the general's phone number, prep his questions, call the general. He has to get him to agree to talk to him. Then he has to take the call from his son. He has to comfort him, evaluate what's ethical to report or not. He has to figure out how to write it in a way that makes people care and helps them understand why it's important. To help him do all this, the Atlantic Magazine pays an editor, probably a few, a team of fact checkers to make sure he didn't miss anything, lawyers to review it. They put the story online and distribute and market it so the facts Barton ferreted out actually get in front of you. In front of us, people. Even after all that, you can't ever really unstir the creamer from the coffee. You have to simply report the creamer is spoiled and hope people listen to you and decide not to take a sip. But what I think many of us have experienced in the last seven or eight years, and what Barton experienced with Richard Patterson, is that people are drinking the spoiled cream anyway. They trust the dairy brand more than they trust the journalists saying it's rotten. This is the thing that's so existentially troubling to me and to lots of journalists I know, and apparently also to our high priest, Barton Gelman. I had a growing loss of confidence in the way I had looked at my journalistic role over the years. I mean, I always felt like I was aiming in my stories for someone, for an audience that wanted to know what's true and that if I found interesting things that were not already in the public record, if I kind of dug in and found something important was happening and I showed my work and I displayed my evidence, that there were lots of people who were open to be convinced about what's true in the world. And 
the super amplified polarization of our sort of politics and media and the kind of epistemological crisis that we're in where uh, it's harder and harder to find any common understanding of the truth was making my work, you know, I wouldn't go nearly as far as saying irrelevant, but less impactful. Uh, I wondered if I was just writing for the already convinced. I mean, I, I, you know, how many people who think that Biden defrauded his way to the 2020 election victory are reading The Atlantic, uh -huh. right? I mean, it started to feel to me like my job was not adequate to our times. And that, you know, my view that truth is sort of an elemental value that needs to be served by, you know, careful sifting of evidence. I mean, it just might not be as important as it seemed to me it was earlier in my career. I was stunned, frankly, to hear Barton's thinking about this. I wasn't surprised that he'd encountered people who dismissed facts and that he was disturbed by that. What shocked me is the conclusion he came to after that experience, that this lifelong journalist's response to our country's turn away from the truth has been to say, maybe truth is a battleground I should cede. Maybe, if my goal is to protect democracy, there are more important battles to fight. I've heard plenty of journalists talk about their own crises of confidence in our work. I mean, even Ira over drinks. You know, like I came into journalism feeling like, oh, if you sort of lay out a case with information that's true, like you could persuade people and that would change something. And I feel like what I've seen is that's not true. But I don't think I've heard any other journalist say what Barton seemed to be saying. That maybe fighting for the truth, which is the foundation of our profession, isn't the most effective use of his energy right now. Not if he wants to improve things. I mean, that's kind of how I've heard you boil it down, that the lesson of that experience. Basically, like, maybe I've been wrong about how important truth is. Our country is in a kind of crisis about truth, and, it's, and, and it really was brought home to me. So I, I made a, a phone call. After a quick break, what Barton Gelman's doing now that he felt he couldn't do as a journalist. And if you want to hear the one anecdote from my interview with Barton Gelman that I really wanted to get in but couldn't figure out a way to, it'll be in our newsletter. That's at kcrw.com slash question everything. The person Barton Gelman called when he decided to leave journalism was the president of the Brennan Center. I said, I'm thinking I want to step off the sidelines. Can you use me over there? And he said, well, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> what do you want to do? And I said, I want to help protect the integrity of the 2024 election. And I want to plan for how you could restrain authoritarian acts by the president if Trump is elected in 2025. And he said, well, we're doing a lot of the one and not as much of the other. You know, the other being planning for... Right, plan, planning for a Trump presidency if he tried to carry out the authoritarian agenda he's talking about. Uh, and so that's... Uh, that's what I did. Barton's preparing for if Donald Trump is elected president again. What he's mostly been up to since he joined the Brennan Center is running war games. Simulations, maybe you've heard of these, not about war per se, but about high stakes scenarios that could happen under a second Trump presidency, kind of like model UN for grownups. Again, the Brennan Center is nonpartisan. They're doing work to prep for a Democratic victory, too. But they acknowledge the unique authoritarian actions that Trump has either taken, such as attempting to prevent the peaceful transfer of power after the last election, or that Trump said he will take if he's elected again. Barton isn't focused on counteracting policies Trump might try to implement, like tax policy or climate or abortion. He's specifically focused on combating what he's identified as authoritarian behavior, figuring out ways to legally restrain a president who's, say, 
turning law enforcement or the military against his enemies or against demonstrators exercising their constitutional right to protest or going after election officials to get them to change results. So over the first half of this year, Barton gathered 175 people from around the country for five simulations, including former officials from the Trump White House and other administrations, former cabinet secretaries and Congress people and governors and state attorneys general, labor leaders, execs, organizers, retired military generals. Everyone was given a role to play. There was a blue team, which were the, quote, pro-democracy forces, and the red team, which included the cabinet, White House staff, and someone playing President Trump. Who was instructed to make his moves based on the sort of known and declared Trump authoritarian agenda. And then, you know, members of his cabinet and his agencies would try to carry them out, and his outside supporters would push them. And pro-democracy forces who could range from governors, state attorney general, um, members of Congress, NGOs, and so forth. And what was the goal of these exercises? We try to restrain him. What was the goal of these exercises? The goal was to go beyond the kind of first step of saying, well, if Trump tries to do that, we'll just sue him. We wanted to see what happens if you iterate over several rounds of moves and people respond to the authoritarian move, and then the president responds to their response, and then they have to think about what to do next. But the objective was to test strategies and tactics that could deflect or delay or the, diminish the damage of what Trump might do um, if he carries out his declared plans. What Barton and the participants learn from running these simulations is that our system is not set up very well to deal with a president, Trump or anyone, intent on abusing their office. We didn't really think it would be likely we could stop him in many areas because the president has so much power. And honestly, uh, there's a structural advantage for the president if he is not especially uh, worried about whether he breaks rules or laws. It's a conundrum. How do you protect the law against someone who doesn't care very much about it? Everybody was a little stunned at how poorly Blue did in the games Mm. to restrain an authoritarian president. And they, you know, almost to a person came out determined to kind of strengthen the guardrails. Barton and his team put together practical lessons from the games. One, they found there was too much of a reliance on lawsuits to try and counteract simulation Trump's behavior. Lawsuits were often too slow for what was happening on the ground. What Barton and the Brennan Center are suggesting instead is that people prepare in advance. They say governors and other state officials should be meeting with their legal teams now to talk about what they could do to push back if Trump were to invoke the Insurrection Act to deploy the military against protesters in U.S. cities or send federal marshals abruptly rounding up anyone who can't prove their legal immigration status on the spot. Or, this is one I hadn't thought of, if one state's National Guard were deployed across the border to another state. Officials should understand the full limits of their own legal power in advance, Barton says, so they're not figuring it out on the fly. And they should publicly declare ahead of the election their red lines and what they would do if Trump crossed them. Like, If Trump sends the National Guard to suppress protesters in Portland, the state of Oregon will do X, Y, Z. Other suggestions Barton and his team came away with. Pro-democracy folks should be raising money and setting up teams of crisis communications people and security experts, and yes, lawyers, to protect election and other state workers who Trump and his allies could slander and put in danger. To fight back if Trump, as he's promised, fires thousands of civil servants he deems corrupt to defend people he sees as his enemies, against whom he's promised to seek retribution. Also, let me use my journalistic platform to inform you. They found in the simulations that one of the most effective ways to push back against presidential abuse of power were sustained mass demonstrations by the public. Barton and his colleagues are sharing these suggestions with people across the country. They're hoping the people who took part in the exercises, many of whom formerly worked in government and still have connections, will go galvanize their colleagues, get them to use these findings to prepare. I get that simulations, advising officials, 
It's not normally the kind of stuff we think of as part of a journalist's job description. But the way Barton framed his career change in the tweet where he announced it, that as a journalist, he was on the sidelines, that was his word, and that he had to shed the title of journalist in order to fight for democracy, I think that struck a nerve with me. I started to wonder if, by Barton's estimation, the work he's doing now can do more for our government and society than reporting in the way we're used to thinking of it. Why couldn't what he's doing now be part of a journalist's job description? Is it really that different? Can I ask you, what were you allowed to do or able to do running these simulations now that you've left journalism that you weren't able to do as a journalist? What I could do differently now in this role was I could design the exercise. Um, I could say, this is what I want to test against. I mean, as a journalist, I couldn't recruit f- former governor or a uh, three-star general to come do an exercise like this and talk them into it. Uh, you I, couldn't or it just kind of was – like I, something I'm interested in just in the part of what my show is trying to interrogate is – you know, what can we reconsider about what we do as journalists? And so I'm curious if you feel like there's something that is just at odds kind of fundamentally between being able to do what you're describing now that you've left journalism and journalism itself, or could we do those things? And should we be doing those things? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think there are some things that journalists can do that are somehow related to this exercise I just did. I mean, you know, journalists and pollsters, bring in focus groups and ask them questions, and they can write about that. I I don't know whether it would be within the normal span of journalism Mm -hmm. to uh, create an exercise like this, a role-playing game. Barton and I went back and forth on this for a bit. I never felt persuaded. I got the sense that the distinction Barton was drawing was in large part a personal one. It sounds like it felt different to you. You felt different doing it. I'm curious about that. Was there a moment where you felt like this is what I left to do? This feels different. This feels like I'm I'm off the sidelines. You know, I had a conversation with one well-known litigator in the democracy space. Uh, and this person sort of apologized for being late to a Zoom call and said I was, you know, sort of finishing logistical arrangements for moving out of the country. Mm. And I could tell from the tone and the look on the face, this wasn't a joke. I said, you're serious? Yes, I'm serious. Uh, If if Trump's elected, I'm not staying. I said, you can't go. I mean, you're exactly the person we need to protect the rule of law. You'll be needed more than ever if Trump wins and tries to do those authoritarian things he's talked about. This person said, look, I I am on a target list of people that Trump and his allies want to prosecute. And I'm just not going to stay here for, you know, kind of spurious criminal charges that are going to ruin my life for years. And that is a dilemma. Uh, it's It's a risk for people who stand up and oppose autocracy. But one of the messages that I'd like to send is you have to stay and fight. You have to stand up. I mean, Americans can't just bow down to an authoritarian and and watch their liberties erode. Um, It's going to take a lot of people to stay and fight. It's interesting that when I asked Barton to tell me a moment that felt different to him from his years as a journalist, the anecdote he finally landed on was this one. I left mulling over why exactly. Then I imagined myself on Barton's end of that conversation with the litigator. My journalist self, talking to a prominent attorney known for filing lawsuits against Trump and his allies, who's making real preparations to decamp from the U.S. if Trump wins again. If this person had made that revelation to me, would my response have been to give them a rallying call? Would I have told them that they had to stay and fight like Barton did? Or would I have simply asked questions, said, tell me more? What led to this decision? How do you feel about it? Can this conversation be on the record? Honestly, I'd probably do the latter. But that's not where Barton's at anymore. He's assumed a whole new identity. I just feel fully comfortable with the idea 
that I am an advocate, that I'm trying to make something happen and not just describe the world as it is. Describing the world as it is is absolutely centrally valuable to American democracy. And I, I, I don't feel a lot like I wasted one minute of my professional life doing that. I may go back to it <laughs> at some point. But uh, right now, I like deliberately setting out to change something as opposed to kind of recording it. Four years ago this month, Barton had just published his story about the 2020 election, the election that could break America. Now we're a month and a half away from the next one, a presidential election that Barton feels is possibly more threatening to our democracy than the last. And Barton's quit journalism, and it feels more unclear than ever what those of us who are still in it should be doing to help fortify our country against authoritarianism. I desperately want journalism to be able to expand enough so we can do that. But it's hard. I don't know what to do exactly. I feel lost and a little embarrassed, like I'm throwing out random ideas. Should news organizations start running war games? Should we send advice to governors on how to combat an autocratic president? Or should we direct our energy inwards towards trying to innovate more in our wheelhouse, turn all our efforts towards fixing this profound problem which led Barton to quit, of people no longer trusting us, no longer believing facts? That's what we take on next week. One of our producers met a married couple that did not have a common understanding of the facts, who were very politically divided, who were brought back together by, of all things, an online newsletter. This newsletter is doing what Barton Gelman was unable to do with firefighter Richard Patterson. It's even changing the minds of people who used to believe the 2020 election was stolen. I have a trust in their news gathering and presentation abilities head and shoulders above any other news gathering source. I have a trust level there that's uh, unequaled. That's coming up on October 10th. Question Everything is a production of KCRW and Placement Theory. Please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Leave us a review if you're so inclined. I want to mention that we did speak to firefighter Richard Patterson, who said he didn't feel he was showing cognitive dissonance when he was talking to Barton and claimed he didn't even remember some of the evidence Barton said he showed him. Patterson told our fact checker, it may well be that I'm stuck on things that are inaccurate, but I would hope that doesn't include things where information comes out that proves it wrong. <laughs>